I'm absolutely thrilled to have on my guest today, Russell Napier of Orlock Advisors. Russell is a macro strategist renowned for his knowledge about uh, finance all throughout history, one of the most well-read people, and he just has a new book out called About the Asian Financial Crisis, Birth of the Age of Debt. Russell, welcome to Forward Guidance. Chuck, just delighted to be here. Thank you. Russell, I'm so glad that you are here. I want to sus- uh, suspend our talk about the current moment where we are with the Federal Reserve, inflation, and really talk about uh, a period of history that I didn't know a ton about uh, until I-, I read your book, which was the Asian financial crisis. It was a boom in Asian emerging market uh, equities started in the early 1980s, ran into the uh, mid 1990s, and it was quite an epic bull run. Something like you know a 1600 percent return for the, the Thailand uh, uh, index. And you uh, were a strategist in Hong Kong, working um, for a stockbroking company. So you it was it was in your your bread was buttered, or not your bread, but the bread of the company you were working for was be, was buttered by be, uh, <laughs> recommending stocks and telling clients that they should be bullish. However, you uh, arrived at somewhat the, the end of the bull, bull market. The often, some stock markets had already uh, peaked. Uh, you were increasingly bearish, and you really go into so much uh, uh, macro fun- fundamentals. So I'm really excited. Russell, how about we start? We, I think you arrived in 1994, 1995. Why did you arrive in Hong Kong? And sort of how did you become an equity strategist in Hong Kong during that period? Well, it's pretty ridiculous that I became an equity strategist in Hong Kong because I was so young and I had had very limited experience. So I joined, started in this business in October 1989. By May 95, I was a strategist in Hong Kong recommending, or sorry, advising global fund managers, which is crazy when you think about it. So how could that happen? Obviously, I would never have got a job recommending or uh, advising people and investing in US stocks at that young and tender age. But this was a new market. I mean, a fairly new market. And in terms of liquidity, it's kind of a market that doesn't have liquidity, kind of isn't a market. So these markets, some of them have been around for a long time, but they were so illiquid that nobody paid any attention. So they were becoming more liquid. Now at that stage, a market that has no liquidity doesn't have anybody, any experts because nobody's really bothered very much. So it was possible to to get a job doing something uh, as, as peculiar as that at a very, a very young age. So that's how I got there. I'd, I'd been a fund manager. And uh, after five years, I was considered to be an expert on everything to do with these markets. So I ended up uh, uh, parachuting in as a strategist in May 1995, uh, but already having covered the markets and already being pretty pessimistic about some of the uh, structural fragilities, which I thought were building up. And the problem with those is you never know when they're going to come home to roost. But what I discovered uh, when I knew before I got there and what I really discovered when I got there, nobody wanted to discuss these structural fragilities. I mean, it was a great big party. You know, when the party's over, give me a ring. Then we'll discuss the structural fragilities. And discussing them early doesn't get you invited to too many parties. What were those structural fragilities? And maybe we'll start with Japan because that was sort of the first one to fall, right? Yeah, the structural fragilities relate to debt. Japan's was slightly different because it related to domestic debt. Uh, the other Asian uh, markets were foreign currency borrowing. Uh, but the the, uh, the Japan one was just, uh, it was a, an, an over or an after shadow of a huge boom, which had involved a lot of domestic currency debt uh, and a massive asset price boom in the late 1980s, which actually was, a, was associated with exchange rate management uh, and an arrangement that Japan had come to with the rest of the world as to how they would manage the exchange rate. It produced far, far too loose a monetary policy in the late 1980s and it burst. What we didn't know in Asia at the time, because we just sort of saw the stock market had collapsed and assumed that the damage was done. But actually, Japan being Japan, they hid quite a lot of the damage. And the damage kind of unslowed, sorry, unfurled slowly through the banking system. And it really did begin to affect the domestic economy by 1996, which is the period we're talking about, the Japanese economy. There were a lot of Japanese banks going bankrupt then. But probably more importantly, it, it led to the Japanese banks pulling credit from Asia. So it wasn't by any stretch of the imagination, the only reason why the Asian crisis came when it came. But the reluctance of or inability of Japanese banks to keep lending, uh, lending foreign currency, a little bit of yen, but actually mainly lending dollars, borrowing dollars in the euro markets and lending them into Asia. The end of that trade played a you know significant part in when this thing came to an end. So, so one did feed into the other. Though, as we'll probably go on to discuss, Asia had its own debt boom. 
uh, which had to crack. But the, uh, the fact that the Japanese banks were becoming more cautious was one of the reasons that the Asian debt boom did crack. Russell, I know you will we'll talk about these structural fragilities that you, that led you to uh, think were uh, the reason of the the, bull, the the boom and then the reason of the bust. But it's my understanding, Russell, that at the time, no one was thinking this way. People explained it via a very different way. Um, what, what were they saying? Why did they think that the sort of the Asian miracle, to what did they attribute that? So there's something called the fundamentals. And all I was saying is that the fundamentals are related to monetary policy. And everyone was saying, no, they're not. So what did they relate these exceptional fundamentals to? Well, the first thing is you could clearly point out that GDP growth in Asia was higher than the developed world. Uh, and you could say that that would be sustainable. And to a large extent, over the long term, it has been sustainable. But then you were making this huge jump to say that the fact that there was high GDP growth would mean that there would be high returns from equities. Uh, one of the first rules of financial history is that's not true. <laughs> I mean, it's simply not true. It depends a little bit on the price that you pay or sort of the value that you pay for these things. But also, it didn't really work. So if we, if we go back to that amazing period, because remember, we're talking about a bust that occurs just as Amazon is coming to the stock market or Amazon is, is becoming a business. Netscape was the first big sort of tech stock that came to the market. And fund managers didn't want anything to do with it. They said the American economy is on a slow growth economy. Asia is a fast growth economy. We'll just buy the growth. And it may sound a bit silly, but a lot of the analysis didn't really get uh, beyond that. So when you sort of started putting a case that a lot of the fundamentals were, were driven by monetary policy, you were told, no, they were driven by higher levels of growth. Uh, now, this was particularly important because a lot of the stocks listed on the stock market were banks and property companies. Now, anyone who's been around the markets for a while knows that these are, are two particular types of companies that really benefit from excess credit growth and excess money growth. So those who wanted to conflated high growth driven by you know banks lending it growth at 30% per annum, money supply growing at 20% per annum. They conflated that with the longer term, higher structural GDP growth, and therefore it's sustainable. And they really didn't look at the valuations. The valuations didn't look outrageous because when you have banks lending at 30% per annum, actually earnings look pretty good. So it was a, it was a mixture of these two things. And as the, as the crisis, or as the as the bear market developed, the thing that kept coming up as the reason you had to buy these stocks is the valuations kept coming down. But people didn't realize that the earnings were a figment of a credit and money bubble. The earnings were not the fundamentals. The earnings were also a bubble. And, and that is, you know, there's lots of things that went wrong. But that was when I was trying to persuade people it was a credit and money bubble that was unwinding. I was told, no, these are high growth economies. And that's reflected in the earnings and people wouldn't buy into no, there was another reason why the earnings were looking so positive. Mm. And was there another element of a certain people would have a view about Asian cultural values, uh, that there was a reason, there was a cultural reason why economic growth was so high? You, you write that that's very important, too. Yeah, it, there was a thing called Asian values at the time. And it, I mean, there, in my opinion, there's no such thing as Asia. It, it's just a thing that Westerners call that part of the world. And the idea that Pakistan and North China or in any way similar is kind of ridiculous. It's, they're about as similar as um, you know California and Peru. I mean, there's just really no, they're, they're even less similar than those two. So anyway, suddenly it was Asian values. And the question, so what, what did we say Asian values were? Well, people really dragged up the Chinese diaspora. Uh, and these are Chinese people who had left China a long time ago, but they were really very dominant in business sectors in Indonesia, Malaysia, obviously Singapore uh, and Thailand. Uh, and they were uh, very important in terms of the listed sector. They were a, you know, they may have been a, a, a sort of cultural minority, but they were a business uh, elite. And people said, well, like, these are very hardworking, thrifty, high saving people. And you may think that that is something in common with Max Weber's Protestantism and the capitalist work ethic. And I think that was all kind of read into it. But of course, OK, so maybe in that little niche, maybe, and I, I don't think actually it's true, but maybe. But Asia is a massive place. Uh, and there was lots of corruption in Asia. There was lots of excessive debt uh, in, in Asia. There were lots of other things going on in Asia. But the, the foreigners came in and they saw the little bit of Asia that kind of, if you like, looked like them. And they, they, they just extrapolated that right across the whole of Asia and said, we're buying uh, Asian values. Now, it turned out that uh, these Chinese entrepreneurs also liked a lot of debt and also liked a lot of speculation, also liked a lot of asset trading, which is another characteristic of the uh, Chinese diaspora. But all of that was kind of forgotten. So people, I mean, it's the same all the time. People chose to see what they wanted to see. 
and Asian values was bandied about very, very widely. And, and Asian, I mean, I think there maybe potentially are Asian values, but they're actually very different from the ones that Westerners wanted to see when they invested in Asia. So when you when you were in Hong Kong and you went to a party with other investment professionals, you're having a drink with someone who is a bull, they would say the two reasons why this is a bull market and it will continue to be a bull market, number one, high economic growth, number two, Asian values, very nebulous. You wouldn't say anything because you didn't want to rock the boat, Russell, but in your head, what were you thinking? What were the structural reasons for the bull market, which would eventually turn uh, a boom into a bust? And specifically, I'm thinking about two things. I'm thinking about uh, uh, exchange currency peg. I'm thinking about uh, capital flows and then also um, interest rates not moving higher to meet inflation. Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing to say is uh, I, I do tend to generally agree with Warren Buffett that price is what you pay and value is what you get. So that is important. And of course, people in a real bull market don't, don't think value is important. So I would I would point that out. But the most important reason for me is nearly every one of these countries was running a very large current account deficit and managed exchange rates at the same time. So they were linking basically to the dollar or some sort of basket that was heavily weighted to a dollar. Now I knew even then knew enough about monetary economics to know that that meant that your monetary policy was really determined by the condition of your external accounts. And as long as capital was pouring in, it didn't matter that you had a current account deficit. Uh, these guys were funding their current account deficit and then they had even excess capital coming in above that. So all their foreign exchanges there were going up which meant that if their foreign exchange rates were going up, the asset of the central bank, the liabilities of the central bank had to be going up. And the liabilities of the central bank was what we call high powered money or commercial bank reserves in the domestic currency. But none of this was within their control. It was entirely and totally out of their control. Once they'd chosen to manage the exchange rate, they just accepted this. And it was creating a great big party. But you could uh, say categorically that if the capital stopped coming, you would get a tight monetary policy. I mean, you didn't have to be a genius to, to say that. The problem was it was a kind of circular argument to make as a stockbroker, because you're saying if the capital stops coming, the prices are going to go down and people will go, yeah, that's right, dummy. If the, if, the, if the capital starts coming, the prices are going to go down. My point was kind of a bigger one, though, which was the monetary policy would tighten and it would begin to undermine the actual earnings themselves. It wasn't just that the price of the equities would, would necessarily go down if there's less money around. Uh, and of course it could be, and you know, I can't say that I, I forecast this, that there could be an extreme situation if money starts to leave, that interest rates would have to go to astronomical levels. And it wouldn't be an economic slowdown you'd be worried about, it would be mass bankruptcy. That is, that is where it ended up. So I, I could see the beginning of the mechanism, and I wouldn't know for sure that it would get to uh, bankruptcy. Uh, and then the other thing lurking behind that was the foreign currency debt. If you and I were running a country like this and uh, capital stopped coming with a current account deficit, we'd be pretty tempted to let the exchange rate go and say, well, we're just going to stop targeting the exchange rate. Now, the go problem down is, to, 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 yeah, to devalue, yes. Just, just step away from it, let it find its own level. But the problem is you get so much foreign currency debt that that in itself was taking you to bankruptcy. So there was a trap here for policymakers. So you can see the trap was sprung. You didn't know when the capital would stop coming and you didn't know how severe it would get. But with valuations already pretty high, I think it was a good bet to uh, to be pretty wary about all of this. And, and just one final thing which helped with this, fund managers have become excruciatingly overweight in these particular assets. So it wasn't impossible that they could keep buying more. But the, the one I've mentioned in the book is the British pension fund industry. And the British pension fund industry had much more money invested in Asia x Japan than they had in America. Uh, I mean, it's kind of incredible to even talk about it. So what I knew is they probably couldn't invest a lot more. And also, if they started to go the other way, these are the big beasts of the investment jungle. Then capital wouldn't be just trickling out. Capital would be flooding out. So it was a combination of all of that. But that's all not what people call the fundamentals. So I would sit in the room and talk about that and people say, but that's nothing to do with the fundamentals. Now, the fundamentals are high earnings, high earnings growth, high GDP growth. So there was a bit like America from 2007 to 2009. There was kind of a real economy here and a financial economy here. And in some people's minds, they were entirely unconnected until one day they realized that they weren't entirely unconnected, which is, I mean, a lesson from this crisis and all crises is that you can't disconnect the two. And that's the, uh, that was the kind of the instability, the structural instability that I saw and saw again in America in 2007. And in a bull market, nobody wants to connect these two things and say they're the same thing. They want to say they're different.
Right. When you said they're running a current account deficit, that's a trade deficit. So even though they're emerging market economies, they are importing more than they are exporting. So in order to have a balanced accounts, capital would have to flow in. And that is what happened uh, you know, in, in a great deal uh, before the crisis. But once it stopped happening, that, that's when you had problems. And also, Russell, you said capital flooded out. It didn't trickle out. One thing you write in your book is that it was short-term money. It was hot money. It was either people buying stocks, which they could easily sell, or it was people investing in short-term uh, uh, bonds, fixed income that they could quickly roll over or get out of. It wasn't a foreign direct investment, which is a very long, slow, I'm going to buy a factory. And you know, if your factory is there, you can't sell it. It's not liquid. It was think the, the money could move very easily, right? Yeah. So I'm delighted you brought that up because actually it's probably the most important thing about timing, which is you know, the most difficult bit, maybe the impossible bit. But the thing that seemed to me that this was getting to a dangerous time was the composition of the capital inflows. And they were coming much shorter term. So if we went back into the early 1990s, they were dominated by foreign direct investment, which kind of wasn't going to wash in and wash out. And now it was shorter term. The other interesting thing about the, the shorter term capital is the narrative. I mean, obviously, there are a lot of bright people making up a narrative why a very large current account deficit is sustainable. The narrative was that these guys were borrowing lots of money offshore. We knew that. But they were going to invest it in productive assets and there was going to be an export boom. So there would be this period where you'd run a large current account deficit. There'd be a period where you'd suck in a lot of capital, but it was all going to be used to build productive capacity for export purposes. And two problems. One, it wasn't. So that was pretty big problem. A lot of it was used for domestic property speculation. But the second thing was in January 1994, China had devalued. Now, China was so incredibly competitive and then began to mobilize hundreds of millions of workers and capital of its own. And the whole story began to fade, the story that this could all be sustainable because it would eventually lead to very high exports and the current account deficit would disappear because we were building these great export assets. As 95 became 96, became 97, there was absolutely no evidence that this was happening. In fact, the evidence was pretty strong that China was undermining this, this whole theoretical export boom. So uh, that's why I believe it's important to read contemporaneous history, things that you look back and say, well, wasn't it stupid that anybody believed that? You know, really bright people believed it. Uh, and there was a good case to be made for it, uh, but it, pr it proved to be wrong. So that's why people stuck with it, saying it's only a matter of time until the export boom comes, the current account deficits close and everything's sustainable. And they never did until Asia itself was forced into crisis and devaluation. Can you speak a little bit, Russell, uh, to what it's like to become bearish at a time when when everyone is raging and in their fervor uh, of being of being bullish? You know, you arrived, you know, having some thoughts and be, gradually became more and more skeptical. What was it like having these thoughts, having this analysis that was skeptical of the boom, while at the same time having to write uh, a research reports? The, the goal of which you were being paid for to sort of facilitate transactions, which meant buying, you know, a, a buy report will always generate more transactions than a sell report. Because as you say, a sell report, you have to already buy it. Whereas a buy report, you can just, you can buy. Yeah, I think it's particularly difficult when you're a stockbroker because you have to go to a morning meeting every morning. And the morning meeting every morning is looking for ideas. And the morning meeting is full of people who have to sell ideas and they want ideas, and they're, every time they pick up a phone, this is what salespeople do, they can tell instantly whether the guy at the end of the phone is more likely to be a buyer or a seller. That's the trick of being a salesman. You can tell it from the intonation of voice, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, to have a strategist who's constantly saying sell all the time doesn't go down very well. So I think on the buy side, it's probably easier, uh, but it's just a matter of trying to survive, really. I mean, that's all. It's just a matter of trying to be there. Uh, when it bursts. And many, many bears don't obviously make it that far. I mean, it's it's mainly, I think, down to luck whether you make it that far. So that's the nature of a, of a we all know that's the nature of a bull market. The, on the way up, the bears have to get squeezed, killed, reduced. And by the time it actually rolls over, most of them are gone anyway. So, uh, that, uh, so that's mainly luck on that bit. But it's not a pleasant scenario to be in. It's a very unpleasant scenario to be in. It has to be, it has to be said, over many years, I've got quite used to it now. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it's more to do with character than intelligence. It's luck and character and nothing to do with intelligence, I would say. Mm. Russell, can we zoom in a little bit on the mechanics of the currency peg? You had foreign capital. Let's take Thailand, for example. Foreign capital was flowing in via the capital account. Uh, uh, capital was flowing out via the, the trade channel, the, the current account. Uh, 
uh, what does the role of a um, currency peg play in that scenario? Because more capital was flowing in, and if there were no currency peg, the Thai bot would appreciate relative to the dollar. But what was the effect of the fact that the currency was picked uh, was pegged? What effect did that have? That the fact that the currency couldn't appreciate it to sort of balance out that 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 macro variable. Yeah. So so this is something we all used to be very familiar with, and you know people were writing about back in the 18th century how this mechanism worked, but we just kind of forgot about it after Bretton Woods. And I think post Bretton Woods, most people came from developed markets and they were used to flexible exchange rates and they forgot this. But anyway, here's the way it used to work in the gold standard. And that's a pretty good model to, to, to start with as to how, how this works. So when there's a, the way it used to work is when every, if everybody was in the same system and everybody linked their currency to everybody else, what would happen is follow. Somebody would be more competitive than somebody else. They would run a current account surplus. There were capital flows, so maybe capital would flow in as well to take advantage of the growth prospects that were there. Now, as you did that, your foreign exchange reserves went up, but also your central bank balance sheet expanded. Let's call it a form of quantitative easing. And in that system, normally, but not always, if your central bank balance sheet expands, growth expands, and inflation goes up. And as inflation goes up in a managed exchange rate regime, then what's supposed to happen is your current account surplus will come down. And this is also this is all a regulating system, uh, and you know David Hume writing in the 18th century pointed out that it would be kind of self-regulating like that, and nobody would ever amass a great pile of reserves, and it would never just keep growing to the sky because by creating the reserves you create domestic liquidity, you create inflation, and you undermine your own competitiveness. Now the system we've lived in for the last 25 years post this crisis has been really quite different from that. But that's the theory behind it. And that is what was happening was happening in Asia. The, the scale of the current account deficits was clearly showing they were becoming more uncompetitive. And some of that was inflation. Some of it was the competitiveness of China. But the market chose to ignore the, the, this, the downside of this particular monetary cycle. It was as if this was a monetary policy that could only ever produce a boom. It was a monetary policy that could never produce a bust. Now, if that was true, we'd all be running that monetary policy. So people had kind of forgotten the mechanism of how you get a bust in a fixed ex or a managed exchange rate regime. And, uh, you know, I find it very difficult to explain to people how it would happen. In fact, probably that's how I gained the reputation, not for calling it, but explaining it. Uh, and when you consider that the first person to explain it did it in the middle of the 18th century, it wasn't a, 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 you didn't have to be a rocket science to, to explain it, but people were very unfamiliar with it because they hadn't really invested in this type of regime before. Remember, most people would not have invested. Most people even then had not been investing money during the Bretton Woods system. Uh, they'd been investing during flexible exchange rates. So the, the mechanism was unfamiliar to people. Uh, and I think well, to some extent still unfamiliar to people when they, you know, I always say when you go to emerging markets, uh, don't buy cheap, cheap equities, buy cheap currencies. If you buy a cheap managed currency, you'll probably get asset inflation and make some money. If you buy what looked like cheap equities in an overvalued exchange rate, as you was possible to do in 1997, then you can lose an absolute fortune. So people didn't understand the, the different monetary mechanism and uh, and learn learn the hard way. So what was it that you saw in 1995, 1996, in terms of the economic data that made you think that the good times could be coming to an end? Was it that the capital inflows were slowing? It was a change in the composition of an outflows. Was it something else? What were you seeing on the ground? You know, now it's easy to look back and, and say, have this theory that, you know, it's, it's easy. But I know at the time it was must have been way more complex and you must have had doubts. And your colleagues must have been, Russell, come on, Russell, don't you know? <laughs> well, when everybody wants to buy something and you're in the business of selling it, it is hard to try and tell them to stop. Uh, we mustn't forget that. Uh, so it was that composition of capital flows that so much of it was short term. So much of it was debt, which we've only kind of touched on at the minute, uh, but also the tenor of the debt became very important. They were borrowing dollars, but it turns out they were borrowing them incredibly short term. Now, there wasn't a lot of good data around at that time, but if you did a little bit of digging, you could find some data to find out that a lot of this paper was like three months. So if the banks, if they say they were American banks lending dollars, suddenly decided they weren't lending to Korea, suddenly that capital was going the other way. The Koreans would have to sell Korean won to buy US dollars to pay back. Americans and I think people didn't pick up just how short term the debt was and how quickly that could could turn around. So that was the uh, the kind of fundamental reason why it, it looked more and more dangerous. It was the nature of the balance sheet, really, the funding, the nature of the funding and the balance sheet, not the PL. This is the problem. The PL looked fantastic. Uh, 
mean, as I said, people said the fundamentals are brilliant. Well, how can you like the fundamentals? Uh, and I think in a situation like this, you do have to spend a lot more time on the balance sheet. Look, I, I was looking at the balance sheet of countries. But if you'd been able to look properly at the balance sheet of companies, you'd have seen this as well. I mean, all that foreign currency debt was being borrowed by listed companies. Now, they were doing everything they could to hide the fact that it was foreign currency debt. So I would say it was the, the thing that made me think this is the time was a deterioration in the balance sheet. And one other thing uh, was the dollar, the dollar exchange rate. Now, I don't think any of us can forecast the dollar exchange rate. It might be the most difficult thing in the world to forecast, given how many people buy and sell it every day. But the dollar had finally turned into a strong currency. Uh, and it was going up all the time. And I knew that if it kept going up, I couldn't forecast that it would keep going up. But if it did keep going up, it was going to result in tighter monetary policy. If you link your currency to a strong currency, you tend to get tighter monetary policy as you try to force your currency up in line with that strong currency. So the strong dollar was another catalyst, which I was writing about at the time and saying, look, I don't really know if this is going to continue. But if this is going to continue, all these structural issues that Asia has, this is the very thing that's going to unve unveil them. Were those capital inflows that you talked about, were they mostly in the form of debt rather than in equity? Uh, because in equity, uh, you know, companies have to issue more shares in order to get the money. And also when you say debt, you mentioned banks. Is that actual banks creating credit rather than uh, via the bond market where they're, they're not you know, sort of creating deposits out of thin air? They're actually you know, using money that, are, that already exists. Um, yeah. So the, the various flows, there were people just putting money in to buy existing equity. So the share, stock market was going up. There was also issuance of equity. So, the, so that was going on as well. That's why the stockbroking community was doing so well. So both things were going on, purchase of existing, issuance of new. Uh, in terms of the debt, these were foreign banks. So these were Japanese banks, these were American banks, and these were US banks who had discovered that GDP growth in Asia was good. The problem was they decided to lend in dollars because they really couldn't access domestic currency. I mean, they didn't have branches. They weren't taking Indonesian rupiah deposits, so they had to lend dollars. But they considered that the Asian currencies were linked to the dollar. And not only that, you can show statistically that all the pressure on the currencies was, was to appreciate. They may have had a whopping great current account deficits, but the reserves were going up. They were struggling to keep them down. So the rationale for foreign banks was, well, let's lend them lots of dollars because their currencies can't really fall. Uh, against the US dollar. And the bond market was interesting because there wasn't really a bond market. There wasn't really a domestic currency bond market. Asia really hadn't got to that stage. So the form of debt that was coming in was banks, lending dollars, and foreign portfolio investors didn't look in any detail at this. And they kind of thought, without even bothering to ask, that these would all be five-year loans. And they sort of knew that they were funding cement factories and they were funding fairly long-term assets. And they never bothered to look to see what the tenor of the dollar loans were. And, and then they discovered to their horror that they were very short. So when the, when the foreign banks wanted out, they, could act, they actually had an exit. You know, it wasn't liquidating a, commercial, a piece of commercial paper denominated in Korean won, selling the won and bringing it out. It was simply not rolling over a three-month commercial loan to a, a Korean, and then the Korean had to liquidate the one. So we hadn't really dug underneath it enough and just thought that debt flows are kind of long-term debt, uh, and it turned out they weren't long-term debt, but we didn't have a bond market in, in those days to really invest in. They were absolutely tiny. Mm. And so that's the tenor issue, the fact that it was very short-term meant that these uh, Asian emerging country uh, markets had to constantly rely on financing. It's not like they locked it in with a 20-year bond. Then there's also the issue of what, oh, oh um, uh, the, the fact that it was denominated in the dollar. If, you know, if I'm a, Brazil, a Brazilian uh, entrepreneur and I borrow in dollars, if the Brazil <laughs> depreciates a, a tremendous amount against the dollar, I have to pay back in dollars. So I have to, you know, if, if it depreciates five times, I have to generate five times as much money as I thought. Whereas if my loan were denominated in real, I would be fine because it, it stays there. And that brings up the issue of the carry trade where investors borrow low yielding currency and use it to fu to fu to uh, lend to high yielding currencies. Can you talk about the role of that? How did the foreign uh, developed banks, Japan, United States, and the like, how did what did, what advantages did they see in lending to those countries? And, and perhaps more importantly, what advantage advantages did the uh, you know does, does a Thai uh, 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 um, a Thai real estate developer, why do they want to borrow in dollars? Yeah, so this was happening on so many levels. So kind of the more amusing level was just the guy in the street who would borrow yen and put it on deposit in Indonesian rupiah. I mean, 
thinking, what, what could possibly go wrong? I can borrow it too. I can deposit it 13. The pressure on the rupee is upward. So the carry trade, we kind of we think well, there must be hedge funds, but actually the average guy in the street was doing this sort of thing. Imagine if you and I were in competition in Thailand, and let's just say we are in the cement business, and you are funding your cement plant by borrowing dollars, and I think in those days, maybe 5 or 6%, and I am borrowing Thai baht at 15%. Well, I'm, I'm, I've got a bit of a problem, haven't I? I mean, you've got a much more competitive situation than I have because your cost of capital is so much lower. So it's easy to look in and say, oh, what an idiot Jack was borrowing in dollars when all the revenues from selling cement in Thailand are in bat. But maybe you did it because I did it. And I, you just simply couldn't compete with me. So there did become this situation where if the difference in the cost of debt was so grave and my competitors were taking the cheap dollar debt, then I probably ultimately ended up having to take the cheap dollar debt uh, as well. So the, so these, so the carry trade we think of today as, as maybe hedge fund operators, but these were real businessmen uh, borrowing this money and they borrowed it because it was cheap, but some of them borrowed it because they were in a dreadful competitive position if they didn't do it, and particularly the property market, which was largely fueled by all of this stuff. And that's an incredibly important input cost in the property market. So they did it. Why did the foreign banks consider this to be a good place to lend? Well, they didn't have a lot of loan growth going on in those days. I mean, the Japanese had zero loan growth. I mean, the Japanese corporate sector was degearing. Their loan books were going to shrink. So they had to find something else to do. Uh, even the US was coming out of um, People forget there was a pretty nasty recession in 1990, 1991. Uh, banks in particular, I mean, the biggest American bank bankruptcy in history until then was actually in 1991, which was Bank of New England. So the banks were not seeing great opportunities. So they saw these opportunities. But fundamentally, they, they saw undervalued exchange rates. They thought the, the only way the, these Asian exchange rates can go is up. Therefore, actually, it isn't risky to lend them. US dollars. So both sides of the bargain thought they'd find this kind of uh, this dream dream scenario. And a few, I mean, there were things central bankers could have done to, to stop it. I mean, particularly by allowing much more volatility in the exchange rates themselves, but they didn't. And you got to remember that the other, the final leg of this is the politicians. They loved it as well because this was getting you capital inflow, it was getting you more money, it was getting you more investment. Uh, and what was not to like? So who didn't benefit from this? Everybody benefited from this until the party ended. And that's probably the greatest parties of all, where there's nobody who doesn't benefit from the party. And then one day, it all goes the other direction. And uh, those, are the, those are the really big ones. So the politicians, the lenders, the borrowers, all thought this was uh, just going to keep going. And so you're at the party. When did you start to hear that the music was slowing? What were the cracks in the dam that you saw? Uh, uh, specifically with regard, you know, we, we all, where this ends is uh, countries like Thailand had to either uh, deflate by raising interest rates or devalue their currencies because raising interest rates will cause capital to flow back back into the country. That's where it ends. And now, so we, we know where it begins. That's where it ends. Tell us about the journey sort of there. Um, you know, what were the first uh, <laughs> warning signs that you saw? So the first crack in the dam comes in the summer of 1996, and it's only in Thailand. So this is called the Asian economic crisis because it infected the whole of Asia, but it didn't start in the whole of Asia. It started in Thailand. And what, with the benefit of hindsight, was that indicator? It was a decline in the foreign exchange reserves of Thailand. So Thailand had spent its life, well, many, many years trying to stop the exchange rate to go up and its reserves went up. And then suddenly when the reserves started to come down, you thought, you said, well, wait a minute, they're actually having to defend the exchange rate now. So that was the first thing. So that dynamic we talked about where everybody wanted to put money in was turning about June, July, August, uh, September of 1996. And then when that happens, obviously if the foreign exchange reserves are coming down, the reserves are coming down, the local domestic commercial bank reserves, then suddenly interest rates started to go up. And that is when people's focus started to turn to Thailand because they didn't expect it. They didn't know what was going on. And then they began to realize that the two were linked, that actually the interest rate that the Bank of Thailand would have to charge was linked to the condition of the external accounts. And then some of the locals who've been borrowing lots of dollars began to get a little bit nervous, saying maybe the Thai baht isn't always going to be pegged to the dollar. And if they start going the other way, then they exacerbate the capital outflow. They exacerbate the rise in it. So we were now on the other side of this. Now, you, just because we'd started the ball rolling didn't mean to say it was going to reach this great kind of avalanche, which it was to do when Thailand didn't devalue until the 2nd of July 1997. 
but you could see that the thing was running in the wrong way. Now, for investors, I think the crucial thing was is as it started going, you could see the impact on the so-called fundamentals. Suddenly, corporate earnings were being downgraded because this was not working to corporate's favor uh, anymore. Interest rates were going up, for instance. So suddenly you can sort of look at the, fun the so-called fundamentals, go, wait a minute, the fundamentals may indeed be related to this perverse monetary policy. And uh, you know, to be clear, that did not infect the rest of Asia for a very long time. The other markets, I can't remember exactly when they peaked, but you know, they kept going up and up. And this was a Thai problem, but at least it was beginning to show that if you ran that sort of monetary policy, there was a downside. And then when the time came, you could look around Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines and say, well, they are running the same policies and they do have a lot of foreign currency debt. Maybe the fundamentals are also a, uh, a picture of that. So I, I'm not going to tell you that the market stood up and started screaming in the summer of 96 that it was all over. Not quite the reverse, but questions started to get asked. The proper questions started to get asked. As you say, Jack, I'm a great fan of financial history, not because it necessarily gives us the right answers, but I think it gives us the right questions. So I would say the second half of 96, people started asking different questions. To me, the questions they should have been asking all along. And once those difficult, more different questions were asked, some of the answers were pretty uncomfortable about where this journey could, could end. But, you know, as I said, it didn't actually end until the 2nd of July, 1997. Could you explain, Russell, the, the mechanism by which the capital account issues that were talked about in Thailand actually reduced the earnings and deteriorated the, the earnings power of uh, Thai corporates, let's say, whether it's a bank, a property company, or, or a shoe manufacturer. How does this sort of very theoretical, very abstract sense of uh, exchange rates and interest rates, how does that on the ground impact how much companies are, are earning in Thailand? So, so it didn't help that the market was completely dominated by finance, banks, and property the three most interest rate sensitive bits of the whole economic system absolutely dominated stock market capitalization. I don't have the number off the top of my head, but I'm gonna say it was probably 60% of entire market cap were in those three businesses. Well, if you're in the business of property and suddenly, so there's a capital outflow, the central bank defends the exchange rate, foreign exchange reserves come down, domestic commercial bank reserves come down, there's a shortage of liquidity for the banks. So they do what we all do if you're borrowing short and lending long. You have to get into the market and just bid up the cost of funds because you have to have your funds. So interest rates start to go up. You're shrinking the supply of uh, reserves. So interest rates start to go up. Now that has a direct impact on property. Uh, you and I, or the, the cost that you and I would have to pay for borrowing to buy a home would go up, for instance. Uh, even corporates who you know, were using debt and use commercial property, the cost of their cost would have to go up. Uh, for banks themselves, that's not good for business when interest rates start to go up. Particularly, remember, these banks didn't have a long bond market to invest in. They were just, this was the cost of deposits. They were having to pay more. They weren't necessarily being able to rush out and buy, you know, invested in this high yielding asset. In fact, they had the high yielding asset they had was loans to the property companies. So the property companies were in trouble now because interest rates were going up. So that's how uh, it's quite easy to work it out for the uh, property companies and for the um, and for the banks. For the companies that were in the kind of industrial sector, it probably wasn't going to be too bad if it didn't infect GDP growth and demand and consumption. Uh, if you, and if you're an exporter, it wouldn't make any difference whatsoever. You may actually have benefited from it in the long run. But, but this did feed into domestic consumption because so much of the domestics were also based on punting various asset classes, the stock market and the property market. So there was a negative wealth effect that began to feed through. And Thailand's not a rich country. There are very, very, very rich people in it, but it's not a rich country. But you find that quite deep into society, there was some form of speculation going on. So the higher interest rates then did have a negative wealth effect, which did lead to lower levels of, uh, lower levels of consumption. And uh, so that's how it became kind of systemic. But it's the nature of any bull, bull market that by the time it reaches the top, you've got too many people involved in it and you've got too much debt involved in it. So it can actually infect something broader than just the asset class. Uh, and this was a classic example of the, how this declining asset class was affecting broader levels of, of GDP. It doesn't happen all the time. I mean, absolutely. I mean, 2000, 2003, the collapse of the dot-com bubble didn't I mean, had, a, had an effect on US economic growth. But it didn't necessarily bring down the whole system the way it did in Thailand. 
and the way it did with the collapse of residential property in America from 2007-2009. So not all popping asset bubbles kind of destroy the economy. Uh, but this one was so big and so pervasive that it fed through into GDP. Yeah, so it was that, that rising cost of capital that really led to that deterioration. On, on page 176, you write that uh, the, the markets are only fair value if terminal dividend growth rates uh, are significantly higher than they are. And you write that all four markets of Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, and Thailand have negative capital spreads and that the cost of capital has ex risen so much that it's now higher than the return on that capital. So you were doing some valuation work and you were saying these are undervalued. However, I'm sure some of your peers, colleagues, uh, were saying were still saying that as the market was going down, that it was a, a great bargain. Can you talk about your analysis and why it differed from some uh, some of your peers? Yes. Yeah, so the number one way that stocks are valued is by looking at their recent earnings. That's what people do. People say, "Well, you know, it made a hundred million dollars last year. It's valued at five hundred million. This is incredibly cheap." And if you live in a market or developed world economy with a reasonably rational monetary policy, the volatility of earnings is kind of like this. And that's why in developed world markets, we have a thing called the cyclically adjusted PE, because we think that we can smooth this out and it gives you a good underlooking valuation. Now, I didn't have a cyclically adjusted PE for Asia at the time, but had I had one, it would have shown they were really cheap uh, because... You know, the earnings have been spectacularly good. So the problem was, what were the earnings going to be in the new monetary system? And it, and you, it was very difficult to tell anybody that that would make much of a difference <laughs> to what they had been. So the history of earnings, the fundamentals would be there. And there would be this kind of shock in the financial system. But ultimately, equities would be valued on the fundamentals. And as the fundamentals wouldn't be changed by the system, then everything would be fine. Now, what I was pointing out was uh, that when you give up this policy, you get exceptionally high nominal interest rates and they give you a big hit to earnings. And the, the problem was not that people couldn't see that because they could see that, but they had no idea of the scope of it. Would earnings that we thought, let's say we thought earnings were at their cyclical low at 100 million, would they fall to 80 in this new system? Would they fall to 70? Would they fall to 20? Nobody knew. And it was really, really difficult, if not impossible, to work it out in a highly leveraged system. They could they could have fallen to, to 20. So the problem was that people just couldn't cope with that uncertainty. So they kind of used the old earnings and said, well, look, we think they're going to fall 30 percent. And even if they fall 30 percent, the thing is cheap. Now, it turns out some of the companies, they fell 100 percent and they went bankrupt. And uh, so there was no anchor, if you like. The, the anchor of the old monetary regime, which gives you an earnings anchor, was gone. And there was nothing else. So when I did finally get to calling the bottom in 1998, it was kind of on things other than value, because it was very difficult to assess what the value actually was. And you talk, so some of your colleagues were saying it's undervalued, it's undervalued. These assets can't be worth so little. I, I forget the statistic, but at some point, the entire market capitalization of Thailand was was smaller than that of a single company in, in the UK. But I think you've noted that actually the assets are worth a lot more, of course, but they also have liabilities. And equity is just the line, but the very thin line of hope between assets and, and liabilities. Um, so it is, it's talked about that and also... How did, how did it play out? Okay, well, the worst one was Indonesia, and we'll just do it in dollar terms. So in dollar terms, you lost 90% of your money. Now, that is basically 1929, 30, 32 in the US. That's how much money you lost. Uh, and others, I'm, I'm doing it from memory. It is in the book. It's got a 70% in some of the others. That's how much you lost. That's a lot of money. Uh, that's an awful lot of money to lose. And that's that's the scale of what was, what was going on here. And these, remember, there were a lot of big pension funds in this thing that were that we're trying to, trying to get out of the system. So, so that, that's important, and it's important to remember it every single time because you'll hear it over and over again that this thing is so cheap it has to be a buy. You know, the, the, the steel inside the buildings is worth more than the market capitalization by the building, and people just kind of forget the liability. And that, that happened all the time in, in this crisis, that this, you know, it has to be a buy because, they, because the assets are here. So never forget the liabilities. And of course, the other thing was we couldn't really value the liabilities anymore because they were in foreign currencies. And we didn't really know the tenors of those very well, nor the interest rates on those uh, very well. So I've always been suspicious of the sort of the simple thing that says, 
it's so cheap it has to be a buy. I mean, there's no excuse. That's just using an excuse for not doing proper analysis and, and kind of pretending there were no li liabilities. Uh, and remember also, this is, this is not the developed world. There were lots of crooks running these businesses, and we obviously, Jack will mention, no names. So uh, it, it wasn't clear that, it may, it may be clear that some equity would survive. It wasn't clear that you as a minority would actually get any of it, <laughs> that it could easily be transferred out to somebody else. There could be intercompany uh, to you know transactions between non-listed and, and listed. So the fact that there was no uh, trust in management and, and often very poor bankruptcy laws as well. So it wasn't really clear who owned what. So it wasn't anywhere near as uh, clear. How, how it ended was a whole myriad of things which you know, would take a long time to go through. But I think the one thing that surprised me and the reason that maybe didn't go even lower is that, the, and we've seen this many times since now, the foreign bankers ultimately stopped pulling credit. The, 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 the Fed did a very good job. Uh, I mean, all the big central bankers were involved in this, but they pulled in all the commercial banks and said, look, you can keep pulling all the credit, but if you keep pulling all the credit, you're all going to get nothing. And this is particularly true for Korea which was a big economy, and they lent a lot of money to Korea. And, you know, if you guys want to keep pulling all this credit, go ahead. But it means you're all going to get nothing. Now, you're going to spend years in the bankruptcy courts of Korea trying to wrestle productive assets from Koreans. Uh, good luck with that. And, it, and, and so it was staunched. That flow of capital was staunched by the actions of the central bankers persuading foreign commercial bankers that there was really no upside to this. And that's happened many times before. And uh, we all a great deal of um, thanks, really, to, to some of the central bankers who, who orchestrated that. I mean, it wasn't the central bank bailout. This was persuading the commercial bankers to uh, act in their joint interests. Uh, was it we, we must all, was it Benjamin Franklin who said, we must all hang together or surely we shall hang individually? <laughs> so, uh, after a long time, commercial bankers tend to hang together. But that was just one part of it, Jack. There were lots of other things going on to stabilize these external accounts. But I think as an investor, that was the most difficult thing to pick up because this is done in private. You know, that we, we, we work in silos, so the portfolio investors didn't necessarily pick up that the commercial bankers had come to this agreement, which turned out to be so important for the direction of capital and the stability of exchange rates and the future of Asia. I really want to get to the aftermath, but I think we might have skipped a step. So the the... Uh, the music is slowing. You, you, you're observing these these strange gyrations and in interest rates in, in Thailand, and you said 1996. Uh, when you know, move move us forward a few months or maybe a year. When did the contagion start to to go to Malaysia, Indonesia? What were the signs that you saw? Were they more drastic? Did you have colleagues who said, "Hey, Russell, I, I think you're right," uh, or you know, and and then tell us maybe you had people who were up until the very bottom, and after that, after them as well, were remained remained bullish. Just tell us what it was like. Well, what you could show for the rest of Asia, as Thailand was getting into trouble, is they had many of the same excesses. You couldn't show that it was going to end the same way, but you could show the same excesses. So once again, this started to raise questions, Malaysia in particular. If it has the same excesses, could it end up going the same way? But the startling thing is that really nobody did very much about it until Thailand actually devalued their exchange rates. And that was on the 2nd of July, 1997. And then there was that roadrunner moment where the roadrunner looks down and people saw that capital was leaving and saw that the mechanism for unveiling the excess was the same for everybody. And the excess, certainly in Malaysia, more than anywhere, uh, a little bit in Indonesia, not so much in the Philippines, but the excess was there and was to be unwound. So it's, it's really a, quite a shocking story for those who believe that markets can discount because the markets didn't discount that what was happening in Thailand could happen. They, they, could, dis they could see that the mess, they could see the problem was the same. But right up until the day Thailand devalues, they couldn't accept that it would uh, the same trigger would be there to, to unwind it. So people went to the uh, right over the edge of the cliff with this outside of Thailand. They may have got some of their capital out of Thailand, but on the whole, with a few exceptions, didn't really retreat from the other markets. And so they all went down at the same time on the same day. And for those who are knowledgeable in history, you will know that that is the day that Hong Kong was handed back to the People's Republic of China on the 1st of July, which was a public holiday. We all woke up on the 2nd of July to find out that we were now in not a Thai economic crisis, but an Asian economic crisis. I know that you uh, were on a relative basis more bullish, more constructive on Hong Kong than you, than you were those four countries that had serious problems. Can you tell us why that was the case? And also, 
why was being taken over by China, which was you know, then and now an, an uh, ostensibly communist country, uh, so good for its capital markets? So what I wrote at the time is that Hong Kong will not devalue its exchange rate and China will not devalue its exchange rate. And guess what? They didn't devalue their exchange rates. So everywhere else, the exchange rates were plummeting. And we should add that by October, they were also collapsing in North Asia, in, in Korea and Taiwan. Uh, so I thought if they're not going to devalue the exchange rate and China's going to continue to grow, big, big call, then Hong Kong is going to continue to benefit. And I didn't see why China would not continue to grow. Uh, it was, these were early days for China. It had only just really started to emerge as an economic superpower. It had, uh, you know, it was starting from such a low base, the growth rate was going to be huge because they were mobilizing all these people. The problem was that all of those things turned out to be true. Uh, the currencies didn't devalue. China did continue to grow. Now, growth slowed, but growth continued. But the markets didn't care. I mean, they just didn't care. And uh, another great part of my... Uh, career then was sitting in rooms trying to argue with people why these currencies wouldn't devalue and why China wouldn't wouldn't slow. But nobody cared. And that's something we alluded to earlier. There was a thing called an Asian asset class. You mentioned the Morgan Stanley Asia X Japan index. Now, if you were sitting in an asset allocation meeting in London or New York, you wanted money out of the index. And the index had Hong Kong, Korea and Taiwan in it. And if you were going to liquidate the index, you were going to pull money out of these things regardless of the so-called fundamentals. So Hong Kong was the, you know, the poster child for this because they didn't devalue the exchange rate. But as a consequence, interest rates went to astronomical levels as capital came out. And those astronomical levels obviously pushed the stock market uh, lower and lower. So it, didn't, I mean, it wasn't down 90%. It was one of the better performing stock markets through all of this. But the fear was really about China. What, I mean, people just thought, well, of course China will devalue. Why won't China devalue? Which I thought was kind of nutty because they had devalued in 1994 and this was 1997. And there's quite a lot of evidence that they were really very competitive at that exchange rate. But anyway, the consensus was China will devalue. Get your money out now before it's too late. Get it out of Hong Kong, get it out of China. And the reason that, that, the, that Hong Kong, China was so important and positive for Hong Kong is that obviously China was moving away from being a communist country. It had just unleashed. And I can't remember. There's a famous Deng Xiaoping tour of southern China, which I, I think I'll date to 94. Anyway, he basically said to get rich is glorious. And the resources of China were unleashed into a form of capitalism. But anyway, whatever it was, it was very good for growth. So that was obviously very good for Hong Kong, which was the entrepot of goods in those days and also the entrepot of capital in those days. So it was, it was the Manhattan of China. So it was going to go through a great boom. But for that period, roughly from, I think the market probably peaked in July 97. So for one year, one year, people thought the reverse. They thought the whole thing was going to collapse. And then, of course, it didn't. And then the, the, game, the game continued. Mm. And, and now let's, let's turn to the uh, title of the book, which is The Birth of the Age of Debt. This is something I have a lot of questions of. How did the Asian financial crisis and its at aftermath, specifically the bailout, even though you said it wasn't a bailout, uh, the IMF's role in, in that, in sort of rescuing that, how did that create this, this new uh, age of debt? Yeah. So what I said is there wasn't really a central bank bailout. The, the thing where you, there wasn't really a Fed put. I'm pausing a little bit because it did end up with a bit of a Fed put at the very end of this because it affected a company called Long Term Capital Management. So at the very end of this, there was an element of the Fed uh, coming coming along, and that was important. But let's let's go back to the the beginning. So the IMF was involved in all of this. So there so there was a bailout from the IMF, but it was the conditions under which they, those were delivered. Now, Asia is a very different culture from America. Wherever you go in Asia, it's not America, right? And every country has a has a right to sort of choose how it develops and how it, society is structured, and and business kind of flows from the structure of society. And and a lot of these business systems were radically different from the American system. They weren't anything like Adam Smith's Invisible Hand. They were completely different. And when the IMF came along, they basically had a template which said, "Now you're going to be like America." Now, you can imagine that that didn't go down very well. Uh, I mean, it was cloaked in other phraseology that you know, we need to destroy crony capitalism. Uh, and maybe you do need to destroy crony capitalism, but it's not actually your business. And that's the business for the people of Indonesia and the people of Malaysia, not necessarily the business of the people from the IMF. So the, 
the, the authorities in these countries took a lesson from this and said, you know, if we don't have a really big kind of protective buffer. Actually, we're not sovereign. At any given point in time, somebody else can come along and tell us how to run these countries. We need to be, we need to build a moat. That's the word we like to use these days when it comes to businesses. And the countries wanted to build a moat as well. Now, building a moat for a country is really accumulating a huge pile of foreign exchange reserves, or at least I thought so. And that's what they set out to do. And that's the birth of the age of debt, Jack, because what it did, uh, and obviously China was at the core of this, but we mustn't forget the other Asian countries were very big in it as well. And they then launched from 98 this massive accumulation of foreign exchange reserves, which is a massive accumulation of developed world debt, 62% of which is United States treasuries. So this held down the yield on treasuries, made debt cheaper in the developed world. Uh, the, the growth, by the way, was $6 trillion worth of foreign currency debt. So that freed up savers in America and elsewhere to go off and finance other things like Elon Musk or whatever they wanted to finance. So there was now lots, even more capital to go and gear up something else in the, in the private sector because a lot of the public sector debt was being held by these people. Interest rates were being held down. Their exchange rates were undervalued, so they were importing deflation to the rest of the world. That kept the central bankers with their rates low because they were terrified of, of deflation. And throughout this entire thing, you just had a perfect prescription for rising asset prices. So rising asset prices, more debt, rising asset prices, more debt. And that's the world that most of us have become very familiar with for the last quarter of a century. And of course, the argument in the book is that it was here we set the, set the foundations first. China devalued in 94, Asia devalues in 97. Then, of course, importantly, the final leg of this stool is China's admission to the WTO in 2001, which really allows it to get going in amassing these reserves. So that's how we, you know, we began this talking about managed exchange rates and reserves circulating in the system. And, you know, Paul Volcker wrote about this in his book, Keeping At It. Uh, and he referred to this system, which really came to home to roost in the mid-1990s as the hybrid system. And the hybrid system had no correcting mechanism. It wasn't as if somebody got very uncompetitive and suddenly the reserves went the other way and monetary policy tightened. It just kept going and going and going because nobody, only half the world was in it. Half the world was floating, half the world was managed, and it allowed us to get this whole thing completely out of kilter and to where we are today, which will lead us on to a, a very different type of monetary system because the hybrid system has taken us to such a dangerous level of debt to GDP ratio. So I, there is a book to be written about that as well, which should I get round to it, will be the next book, just explaining the, the mechanism of how, how we go and, wh and where we go next. But we have to change the global monetary system because that is ultimately responsible. Uh, and you, you will note you know, that very brief description I've given you there is also the root cause of inequality. It's also the root cause of you know, social problems that we have. And it's uh, most people when they talk about these things, don't think about a global monetary system, but Volcker did, and he understood how this was coming from a badly, look, it wasn't even a designed monetary system, it was a kind of an ad hoc global monetary system. This is the root cause of everything, and therefore, to fix it, it's going to have to be changed. I'd love to say that they'll fix it and make a better job of fixing it, but when it comes to politicians, there's every prospect that they'll make a worse job when they try to fix it. You use some phrases, like you said, sadly, now we're in the wage, age with debt. It's, it creates inequality. What would the, the world that uh, is, is not the situation we're in now, where the U.S. has running a huge trade deficit, uh, but it has a, a huge capital uh, inflows, what would, what, what would that uh, world look like? And why do you think it is preferable to, to the age of debt that we're in now? So we're not, we're not, that's not talking about what's coming next because there's something worse coming next. But in, in the system, if we, did, if we designed the system correctly back then, let's say we'd all got in a room in late 1998 and said, you know what, the whole world was on the verge of depression. Let's design a new system. Well, now it maybe would have been something like the Bretton Woods where we'd all agreed the levels of our exchange rates that would be fairly close together. And what that would mean is there would be some sort of self-regulation as somebody got too competitive, they would create too much inflation, then they'd become uncompetitive. Reserves would move around. The bottom line is we wouldn't have this much debt. We just wouldn't have this much debt. Interest rates wouldn't have stayed as low. Uh, there wouldn't have been so much capital flowing in permanently, government-mandated capital flowing into one place to fund it. So we would have had a much lower debt-to-GDP ratio. I think we'd have had lower asset valuations as well. Uh, and I think we'd have had uh, significant more equality as well. Remember, one of the key drivers of this was China was so cheap on the exchange rate that it did take a lot of pretty good jobs out of America. I mean, other jobs replaced it, but they weren't as good jobs. So I would say that had we 
you know, followed uh, in 1998 in October in Washington, D.C., Bill Clinton, President Bill Clinton made a speech saying that we had to do all this, saying that we have to now build a Bretton Woods for the 21st century. And had we built it, I think we'd have less inequality, less debt, greater economic stability and fewer imbalances. But that's a world that never happens. So now we have, what do we do about the world that we have? And sadly, it isn't going to be going to that because the number one priority for all of these people now is to destroy the levels of debt. We were starting at pretty high levels of debt to GDP. So if I go back to America's debt to GDP level, then for the whole economy, it was probably, I'm going to say about 150% of GDP. It's now 290% of GDP. So it's too late. It's too late, I think, to go back to a kind of reasonable Bretton Woods style system with relatively low inflation. I think we're going to have to go for something significantly more aggressive. That opportunity passed. We're starting from a different place and it's going to need a different political remedy. Did you say we're going to need significantly higher inflation? Did I hear you right? Yeah, that, that's the, that's, I mean, I mean, I know the Fed keeps talking about how it's going to come to, uh, tackle inflation, but it doesn't actually mean it. I mean, they know that these debts have to be inflated away and they are complicit in inflating them away. Uh, so there'll be lots of jaw jaw against inflation, but not a lot of war war against inflation because it's uh, it's essential to to fix the balance sheet and try and not de gear. And we've been here before. I mean, we were here after World War Two. Uh, the United Kingdom was here after the Napoleonic Wars. It was here after the First World War, after the Second World War. There are tried and tested ways of dealing with this. And in a democracy, the tried and tested way is inflation. Mm. You said earlier that. I asked you a question of what would the system that you envision as a solution, what would that look like? And you, you made it clear at the outset, that's not what's coming. What's coming is much worse. What is coming? So what is coming is a world where we have to permanently keep inflation above the discount rate. And, and I know a lot of people who will be watching this are probably schooled in finance and would argue, well, that's impossible. You know, because the kind of what we teach us in the finance faculty is that people who lend money will always demand compensation for inflation risk. And therefore, nominal rates will always reflect inflation and they probably will always be slightly ahead of inflation to reflect the inflation risk. Now, if you read a book on market economics, that seems to me a very sensible thing to say. As someone who lends money myself, uh, I would want compensated for future inflation. And then we have the real world and financial history, and that hasn't always been the case. Sometimes it's been essential to move away from a market economy where the cost and price of money is determined, long run cost of money is determined by the private sector's willingness to lend it and impose something else. So we have to move to that system. Now that's really uh, going down the rabbit hole because in a world where the discount rate and the, and the inflation rate are unconnected, all sorts of perverse things can happen in capital allocation. And I don't just mean capital allocation in portfolio markets, capital allocation in terms of plant machinery and equipment. Because when you have the wrong real discount rate, anything is possible. And it just misallocates capital into all sorts of silly things. So in the, in the last time we did this, mainly more Europe than America after World War II, you know, it, it poured capital into old master paintings. Old master paintings were owned by pension funds. Now, to have a productive economy, it would be nice if pension funds lent to corporations that did productive things and in the process, hopefully employed people as well. But actually, we were funneling capital into gold and old master paintings and classic cars. And so, so this is the problem. It's not a kind of theoretical problem that this, you know, it's bad for savers. It's bad for the whole economy because capital will be misallocated. So that's what I mean about this is much worse than sort of returning to a kind of Bretton Woods stability. Because this misallocation of capital infects the whole, the whole system. And sometimes it takes a long time to, to show up as misallocation of capital. But what we get there in the end, and in the end, what you get if you, if you misallocate capital so badly is actually stagflation, which is uh, high unemployment and high inflation. That doesn't have to be this year, next year, or the year after. But that's where we got to the last time. Like the word stagflation wasn't invented until 1966 because nobody had ever seen it before. It wasn't thought possible to have high unemployment and high inflation, but in a financial repression where you sever the link between these two variables, which is something we hadn't done before outside of warfare, then you do get high unemployment and high inflation right down the line. But in the early days of this, it's really quite a warm bath and people quite love it. Wages are going up and mortgage rates aren't. And you know people kind of like that. Yeah, I, I want to draw attention to, to something you said. Some viewers may be familiar with the concept of negative real rates, that inflation is running higher than the risk-free rate. But I, that is not what you said. 
you said not that inflation is higher than the risk-free rate, but inflation is higher than the discount rate, which is used for valuing risk assets such as equities, which is uh, the, the, the discount rate is, you know, this is very off, off the cuff, but it's, it's the uh, sum of the risk-free, excuse me, the discount rate is the sum of the risk-free rate plus a risk premium. So yeah, that, that, is, that is really wonky. Uh, what, wacky, I should say, what, are there any parallels in, in history uh, that come to mind, the 1960s, 1940s, where inflation was so high, it was running higher than the cost of equity? And yeah, that seems like a very bizarre world. What are some of the consequences of that? Well, I like the, I like the phrase wacky because that's weird at average cost of capital, isn't it? So it's in there. <laughs> yes. it's, all in, it's all in there somewhere. Uh, the one I like to talk about more than any is my early days, early days in Hong Kong, so before this bust. So the interesting thing about Hong Kong is it has a currency board system, which means it gets U.S. nominal interest rates, but it gets whatever the domestic level of inflation is. And in those days, because Hong Kong was plugged into this great growth engine of China, interest rates were coming down in America in the early 1990s. We had that bust, particularly in New England and Texas, and Chinese growth was going up. So inflation just kept going up to, I think, 12 percent and interest rates came to three. And what happened is the stock market tripled. So that so that's what happens. I mean, you can kind of argue potentially that the correct cost, correct valuation for equity in that word is infinity. Now, obviously, it isn't because there are societal problems that come along, and eventually we we reverse all of this and just say this is nuts and we have to stop it. But you get an excessively high level of of equity valuation in the in that world until one day something comes along that says this is unsustainable, and sometimes that has to be something that's social. That, uh, you know, I mean, I've just read actually Arthur Burns' speech from 1979, Arthur Burns having been the chairman of the Federal Reserve during the runaway inflation. And, you know, gets a lot of criticism for accommodating uh, Johnson and Nixon, and but says, look, this was about society. So, and until society wanted to do something about all of this nonsense, we couldn't do anything about it. Uh, I have something here to show you another way we try to do something about it. I don't know if you've ever seen, seen one of these before. I like to wave these around. So we're in the mid-1970s. It's 1974. Gerald Ford has just come into office. Uh, everybody knows that one way to combat inflation is to put interest rates up. I mean, it's not as if that was a secret. Everybody knew that's what could be done. But instead, Gerald Ford decided to mail these to Americans. Now, whip inflation now is what this means. W-I-N, whip inflation now. And the idea was that this would, this would combat inflation. So you got just massive distortions in, in everything. And everybody knew how to fix it, and nobody had the guts to do it. And that's the bottom line. And really, it was until the people demanded that something was done about it, which was incredibly painful. You know, people you know, talk about Volcker and one of the great things he did. People, believe me, people didn't think it was great at the time. Uh, Volcker was, was mailed lots of two by fours by the construction industry who didn't like chunks of it. And he used to have one in his apartment, actually just to remind them of, of these. So society has to get to a stage where it doesn't want wacky policy, but it can take quite a long time before we say enough of the wacky. And uh, in America, it took a long time before we got to the, and a lot of pain before we got to the, uh, let's uh, throw away. Fortunately, they didn't all throw away their win badges. That's why I'm able to buy them on eBay. <laughs> now, I'm glad that you brought up Hong Kong as an example of inflation running much higher than discount rates as, as it can be very bullish. And yeah, that makes a lot of sense because the value of a, of a stock is its earnings and then the multiple on that earnings. And inflation is obviously very good for earnings because the economy is running super hot. And then the multiple on the earnings, typically it's thought that th that contracts because lo uh, long-term bonds sell off and yields rise. And then that's part of the use as, as the discount rate. But but yeah, if, if we're in a world where Long term, you know, the 30 year stays at 2% as inflation is 7% for the next five years. I'm not saying it is. I mean, how could that not be great for pretty much every single stock? That's what I think happens. So I'm more optimistic. But of course, I'm not foolish enough to think that that can go on forever. So there has to be something that brings it to an end. Uh, nine out of 10 bears will tell you it's because interest rates have to go shooting up eventually. Uh, well, eventually it could be 10, 15 years from now. So I think, I think before that, we'll, we, you know, keeping these interest rates down is not easy. It's not as if you wave a magic wand and the 10-year bond yield stays at two. So looking at the history of these systems, at some stage we have to force savings institutions to buy these bonds. And of course, if you're forcing them to buy the bonds, you're forcing them effectively to sell equities. Uh, 
So I think the cap on equity valuations is not through the market mechanism where the discount rate eventually has to go up. It's up through a whole different thing, which is this massive distortion to the savings system on the compulsory liquidation of equities. So that's a very different type of bear market, not one that I can convince many people of is going to happen. Uh, because everyone's in the view that the Fed will drive rates to such a level that it will destroy the economy and destroy equity valuations. That's what's playing out in the markets as we speak, Jack. I think they're wrong. I don't think the Fed is going to get interest rates anywhere near high enough to, to stop what is going to be a runaway economic recovery and inflation. And eventually we'll go to plan B. And uh, one thing I know about politicians, if they're going to make the same mistake for the second time, they'll give it a different name. So I don't know what the, the, the win badge will be called this time. But I bet you there'll be, a, there'll be an equivalent of the win badge in four or five years from now from a politician who will do anything to control prices except raise interest rates. You say that you don't think central bankers, the Fed, will be able to raise interest rates to a level sufficient to fight inflation. We're recording this on the 27th of January, the day after the conclusion of the FOMC meeting which was generally seen as a, as a hawkish move and Fed funds futures uh, um, I should say rose, declined, whatever. They're, price, they're pricing in uh, more hawkishness to come. And so, so much so that about five rate hikes are, are priced in for the Fed funds rate by December of this year. When you say that the central banks, they won't do enough rate hikes, do you think, yes, they'll get to five, but five won't be enough? Or do you think, no, five is enough, but they're, they're only going to get to two because of, I don't know, uh, uh, they have concerns about the equity market or, or something else? Yeah, I don't know if they'll get to five, but I know it won't be enough, even if they do get to five, because we have to look at what's going to happen to nominal GDP growth over the next two years. Uh, there is also an 18 to 24 month time lag between monetary policy decisions and uh, impact. That's what's uh, generally considered to be the case. Uh, there is, where do, we, where do we begin here? We've had obviously uh, compulsorily restrained consumption, particularly of services. It's been illegal to consume lots of services. So that's going to come bursting out, something we haven't really seen since wartime. You know, obviously in wartime, there's lots of things that are illegal as well. So that's going to be there. There is, in my estimate, at least two trillion US dollars in excess liquid savings on household balance sheets. That's just where the look at the savings rate got to compared to where it was pre-COVID. Uh, now, unless people save all of that, that is going to turn up in uh, some form of consumption. There's always pent up demand after a recession anyway, uh, and that's going to be there. Bank credit growth is really starting to pick up very quickly. So somebody's borrowing money to do something, even if the newspapers keep telling us that the Federal Reserve is stopping them. There's quite a lot of evidence that they aren't. Uh, broad money growth is now growing at 13%. Bank credit growth at 16%. Total of growth in dollars over the last two years is 43%. Sorry, Russell, can you explain uh, when you say broad money growth, what, what is that? Is that M M2? And you know, what, is M what is broad money growth? So the, the broadest measure now current publicly available now in the US is M2. We used to have M3. So it's it's the closest we can get, although not very accurate, to the total amount of dollars in the world. It's not actually that, you know, the total amount of dollars in the world is bigger, but it's the best proxy we have. And it's grown 43% in two years. Now, I'm being told all the time that five interest normal interest rate rises are going to stop this rip-roaring economic recovery. And I just don't think they are. And I think the, the, we're going to consider, or the policymakers will consider, there must be other ways to try and stop this thing because interest rates aren't working. And what level of rates would we have to get to to even begin to try and slow this thing down? We're starting with inflation today at seven. So I think they've, they've you know, they, 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 this, this horse has bolted. And there are things they'll do. I mean, I was not joking when I said price controls are one of the things. The French have already gone for price controls. They've uh, screwed their electricity generator to try and keep down the price of energy. So that sort of thing, and ultimately controlling bank credit growth with a uh, something other than interest rates, like uh, credit controls, credit quantity controls, is something we get to. And all of these fit within the financial repression toolkit. All of these take us away from a market system. But anybody who says that the Fed will do all of this via interest rates clearly believes that we're staying in the old system and doesn't believe. Now, they might be right, and I could be wrong. Uh, but there's a hell of a bet to be made here. Either we're in the same old system where the Fed uses nominal rates to control everything, or we're going to a system where all of these other horrible bits of the toolkit have to be used. And I'm strongly in the second camp. But as of this morning, uh, the market is clearly of the view that the Fed can drive rates to a level to destroy equity valuations and destroy growth. And I think they can't do either with the tool of nominal interest rates. Mm. Mm. Russell, uh 
you were, had a disinflationary view uh, for, for the past decade and recently you've changed. It's, it's, it's quite remarkable, you know, to what degree you've, you've changed your mind. You don't change your mind often, but, but when you do and you see the facts change, you, you really make a pivot. Uh, the, the quantitative easing, the, the explosion in bank reserves that from 2010 to, let's say, early 2020, before the pandemic, did not cause inflation, despite the fact that so many people thought, thought, it, thought it would. Uh, why do you think that the huge increase in money supply this time in terms of bank reserves is going to make it into the economy? Yeah, so it's it's different types of money, which is the key thing. So bank reserves are, a, are, are an asset of the of the commercial banking system. They are, if you like, the liquidity of the commercial banking system. If you and I were bankers, it's kind of the money we have on hand to pay back our depositors. It's just, it's not in the form of cash, but it can be turned to cash instantly. If we suddenly get a lot of it, the question is, what do we do with it? And if we kind of sit on it, not a lot happens in the real economy. And that is what's what that is exactly what was happening with that money from 2009 to 2019. It was affecting the asset markets because the Fed was buying assets from savings institutions, bonds, and accrediting them with new money. And of course, what does an, what does a savings institution do with new money? It buys more assets. So that this this money sort of stuck in that ghetto. But the money that was credited the, to the savings institutions was a thing called bank reserves, and they were really kind of unused. So the only thing that's different is that the banks are now expanding their balance sheets and quite aggressively. And that creates a different form of money. I mean, people who borrow money from banks tend to use it in the real economy. They can, of course, just use it in the to buy assets, but on the whole, it tends to get used in the real economy, and that's broad money. And the history of that money is that that is the inflationary form of money because it affects nominal GDP, it affects final demand. And as I said, it's up 43% over two years. Uh, I'm just pausing. Just imagine if nominal demand now went up 43% over the next two years. I mean, it seems impossible. But a huge amount of that can now explode into, into nominal demand. That couldn't have happened with commercial bank reserves. It just simply couldn't have happened unless the banks had turned that into loans and they didn't. So that, that's the fundamental difference. And I see it everywhere. And I see it as a norm of government policy. This is the crucial thing. It's not a an emergency measure that was put in there. It's not that the banks are necessarily wanting to do it. It's the governments have suddenly realized just how powerful it is. If you can control, influence, cajole with carrots and sticks, the growth of commercial banks balance sheets, you can achieve all your wildest dreams until you get too much inflation. And that's kind of where we are already, but there'll be plenty more of this to come. Uh, abusing commercial bankers is the new game in town for governments. I mean, if you're tapped on what you can borrow in the markets, uh, if if uh, expanding the central bank balance sheet doesn't work, then abuse a banker. And that's, uh, that's where we go next. I mean, it's funny for the bankers. For, for 10 years, they were the problem. And then we, they woke up one morning and they, was, they were the solution. And uh, it would be an interesting historical essay to write. Is it better to be a problem or a solution? Because being a solution can also be a hell of a problem if you're trying to run a commercial organization. Right. So uh, Jerome Powell and a lot of other economists attribute a lot of the inflation to supply chain issues, supply bottlenecks, rather than underlying dynamics in the fiscal and monetary impulses. Do you agree with that? Uh, what percentage of inflation do you think is responsible to supply chain issues? Um, you know, clearly it's, it's non-zero, but it's, you know, do you think it's the majority is actually a, a monetary demand creation of money that's fueling inflation? The the the, mon uh, the Milton Friedman style inflation of inflation is everywhere a monetary phenomena, not supply chain. And also, how are you thinking about fiscal drag? You know, the the real explosion in uh, uh, government deficits, particularly in the U.S., that where the government was mailing people uh, checks in some cases in excess of what they could earn in the job market. That period is over. So, do you think that that sort of inflationary impulse is is slowing? Yeah, so I'm definitely more in the uh, in the Friedman camp. I, I think we can all sit down for, and we can write learned papers on the supply side disruption, and somebody might be better than that at somebody else. And I agree that on, on the whole, the supply side reacts, supply goes up, and these price things pass. I don't really have to disagree with that. My other question is, what's that got to do with the underlying and long-term rate of inflation? If money supply growth is, you know, was at 27% and has settled all the way to 14%, you have to look through that. You have to look through the supply side disruption, which none of us can forecast with any great degree of certainty, and say, let's find all those periods in history where broad money growth was at 14%, where it had gone up 43% in two years, and inflation was low. Well, good luck. You won't find them. 
So behind all of this, we're trying to sort of work out how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. When does the supply side thing fix itself? When does that drop out? And then believe that somehow behind that, all the monetary stuff was irrelevant. So as long as you believe that the monetary stuff is irrelevant, you don't have to work out how many angels can dance on the head of this particular pin. You just have to realize that that is inflationary. I did mention, it's interesting, the ECB actually used this statistic that monetary policy will impact the real economy and inflation 18 to 24 months after it's instigated. Well, we started all this in March 2020, April 2020, May 2020, which is quite spectacular in terms of the timing, because it does suggest that a lot that, that maybe Jay Powell is somewhat right, that maybe what we've seen so far is actually supply side. And that's really scary, because what it's saying is that the real monetary impact of inflation is only just beginning to hit. And as I said, the, the growth rate was 43%. So uh, if, if central bankers are right in their, in their kind of lags on this, then there's a lot more uh, there's a lot more to come in inflation. So I think he's uh, I think he's just wrong on this. And it's very hard to bet on low inflation when broad money growth is really that high. Uh, in the book, you write that a bull market has two features, an earnings cycle and liquidity cycle. They rarely coincide because central bankers want to spoil the party in order to curb inflation. Having seen Jay Powell speak yesterday, pretty clear that the, the, the party spoil is imminent. Um, what are you making in terms of the equity market now that the liquidity cycle is winding down or going to start? The impulse for the liquidity cycle is about to wind down, but earnings seem very robust. You know, we're kind of in the thick of, of earnings today. I think actually Apple Apple reports its earnings today. I don't know what it is. But um, so far, we've seen companies like Microsoft smash the uh, analyst estimates out of the park, and yet the stocks go down. Does that to you, uh, is that a phenomenon of the earnings cycle is, is still strong, still mid-cycle, but the liquidity cycle is nearing its end. So, so when the two are in competition, what you should get is rotation. You should get people moving within the market, and there'll still be a bull market somewhere within the market, and that's what we're getting in terms of value stocks, or at least I think it started, and I think it will continue, that there'll be a rotation to value because the impact of the higher interest rate will not be as negative as rapid, as will not offset the pace of growth in earnings for economically sensitive, cyclical, value-oriented stocks. So that rotation will go on and those stocks will continue to go up. I, I just one thing where I don't really completely agree, it is, it is obvious that if the Fed puts interest rates up, and particularly if it contracts its balance sheet, that it is restricting liquidity to the banks, i.e. the reserves, and also to the market, because it's actually going to be not buying bonds from the market. So in terms of that liquidity cycle, I think you know that is not good for the market. However, meanwhile, over in the real economy, the banks are creating liquidity like it's going out of fashion. And that's the liquidity that affects nominal GDP growth. So that's your friction. You've got this friction in the kind of the, the, the financial markets, but it can be more than outweighed by the outlook for the liquidity in the real economy. If that feeds through to earnings, it can, that can offset the negatives coming from the other market. So I'm more in that camp. Uh, and it's not a consensus view at all uh, that the liquidity being created by the commercial banks is really going to feed into such high levels of nominal GDP growth that for certain stocks, it can more than offset what is a marginal drain on liquidity from the financial markets. So liquidity is a slippery concept, to put it mildly. Uh, but the liquidity, I think, that ultimately counts, even for the stock market, is that kind of broad money, total amount of dollars in the system. And I think that will keep the stock market going up, but particularly non-growth, particularly more value rather than growth. And we, we are seeing that rotation, uh, that rotation already. As I said, it doesn't go on forever because it gets so out of control that we have to go more towards repressionary policies rather than these interest rate rises. So one of the things I think that might condition the next year is that Jay Powell keeps raising rates and the economy keeps expanding and the stock market keeps going up. And then people will be really shocked. And then they'll say, well, we have to do something else because clearly interest rates don't work. Now, that's not the consensus in the market. The consensus in the market seems to be Jay Powell will destroy the market and destroy the economy. So I think it's more likely to be the other way around. And then we start looking around for other brilliant ideas as to how we control this economy. Yeah, uh, you mentioned the value rotation when the earnings cycle and liquidity cycle are in conflict. We are definitely seeing that uh, the overperformance of value relative to growth, at least in the U.S. over the past month, is stark, particularly year to date. I think the only sector that's up in the S&P 500, uh, the SPDR sector, is XLE, is, is the energy sector. 
I, I hear this a lot and I see some sort of anecdotal evidence for it, Russell, that inflationary times are good for value stocks. And you can see that in the 1970s when it was gold miners and energy companies that thrived while the nifty 50 technology stocks got uh, you know, obliterated. But looking, looking back until other inflationary periods, perhaps the 1940s or the 19, after World War I, you know, um, you know, 1919, 1920, uh, it's very, you know, I, I have not done a ton of work on it, but I've tried to sort of quickly find data on value versus growth in inflation periods other than the 1970s. And I haven't put the necessary work in. Russell, you, I know you are a, a, a polymath across history. What uh, periods, whether it's the 1940s or, or whatever inflationary periods, support the argument that inflation inherently will, uh, you know, is, 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 inclined to benefit value companies more than growth companies. Yeah. So the, so the data set goes back to, I think it's 1929, which is the French FAMA data set where they split out value and growth. And there are lots of quibbles, as you know, about how you divine the two. But anyway, that's what we're going to use because that's the best thing available. And I wrote a large report on that for clients Christmas 2020. And there aren't a lot of times when inflation kind of really breaks out. But, but obviously going from the 30s to the 40s is one of them. Uh, America brings in price controls, of course, during World War II. So the you know the actual rate of inflation is significantly higher than it's reported. But the biggest outperformance ever of value relative to growth was going from the 30s into the 40s, from going from a deflation to what is a you know the, the sort of inflation you get associated with warfare, and then you get the same thing happening the next time when you go from the 60s to the 70s. Now, is that a big enough sample bit? I know people watching this will think that that is an incredibly long period from 1929, but actually you've only got a couple of samples uh, in there. But anyway, for what it's worth, two, two examples, both of them worked out pretty well for owning value uh, relative, relative to growth. I have looked uh, recently at more detail within uh, using the Ibbotson data, looking at the, that long kind of bear market from 1966 to 1982. Remember, the Dow Jones hits 1,000 in 66, and by 82, it's at 600. So that's a hell of a bear market, uh, particularly in a world of high inflation. And then you look at what sectors of the stock market actually manage to preserve wealth, reinvested dividends, compounding, rising faster than inflation. And once again, you get value stocks, but particularly mid-cap value and small-cap stocks as well. So that doesn't mean to say this has to repeat, but it's a, at least a intriguing sign that for someone who's concerned about inflation, that there will be sections of the equity market, not the equity market, but there will be sections of the equity market where you can outperform. Uh, and I think value is one of them. And value is global. You know, it's not just America we're talking about here. If I was to look at all the equities in all the world, the most expensive are the US, uh, even value stocks. Now, if I start looking elsewhere in the world, maybe Japan, I will find very cheap well, in my opinion, very cheap value stocks. If I look at certain industries all around the world, which have had to compete with China and where that competition may be lifting, you'll find very cheap stocks. So uh, I do think it's value, but not necessarily American value stocks. But uh, at least historically, they have been able to play a role. So twice it's worked. Uh, if you want to build a portfolio around two, uh, two samples, then uh, let's build it on value stocks. Uh, Russell, what countries other than Japan uh, draw your gaze uh, in terms of value. I know Europe is historically a pretty cheap market because it doesn't grow that fast and, and other reasons. Uh, you know, how are you thinking about Europe, China, as well as the emerging market countries, some of which you know, we, were, we were talking about in the 1990s? Yeah, well, not China. I mean, I do think we're heading to a cold war with China where it could easily be illegal to invest money in China. I mean, that usually gets people very upset. But you know, that's what a cold war is. That's what the last cold war was. And it's not clear to me that Investing money in China will mean you, you'll be allowed to bring it out, whether by the Chinese or by the Americans. Uh, you may not be allowed to do it. So there's just this kind of huge geopolitical risk on investing in China that, you know, uh, things can look very cheap for a good reason. Uh, for those of, uh, there's no one old enough to remember this, but there were, the French in particular, were huge investors in Russian bonds in the early 20th century. And that didn't work well in 1916. So, you know, there there are, you can't ignore these geopolitical risks. So it wouldn't. It definitely wouldn't be China. I think, Jack. It's it's so for for countries, it's Japan. But beyond that, it's really about industries, and that takes us back to what investing is really all about. It's fi trying to find industries. So I have recently written for my clients about the capital cycle. Uh, there are two wonderful books on this. One is called Capital Account, and the other is called Capital Returns, which are the uh, the edited letters of the. The, the fund management company Marathon Asset Management. Uh, and it seems to me that in the new world that we're going into, there are lots of bits of the capital cycle which have been underinvested in for many, many, many years, where returns would go up for many, many, many years. 
and valuations are low. And they tend to be what we call heavy industry or capital heavy companies, where just the sheer scale of the Chinese production boom and capacity boom has, has destroyed returns. So it's more, I think, about industries than countries. But in terms of where these kind of things come together, uh, Japan, also that helps from a geopolitical perspective, Japan clearly being an ally of America in any forthcoming Cold War. Japan seems to be the place where these things come together best, but it's an industry rather than country thing. Well, uh, Russell, you've been extremely generous with your time and insights. Uh, my final question is something, unfortunately, we didn't have time to get into, uh, but just quickly, one key theme in the book is the problems with index composition. Uh, the Chinese economy, as measured by GDP, was seven times bigger than Malaysia. Malaysia was 18% of the MSCI uh, ex-Japan index, while China was only 0.6%. So even though the Chinese economy was seven times bigger than Malaysia's, Malaysia was 31 times greater than China in the index. And that was obviously a huge problem in the 1990s for people who just bought the index. My final question, Russell, is do you foresee the same thing for people who are buying the index now? Because... Although the top 10 companies in the S&P 500, they're certainly high quality companies that thrive in a disinflationary environment. They may not, you know, they may not, not do so well in the inflation environment that you envision. Yeah, I, I absolutely believe that's correct. I mean, in, in a momentum oriented market, the index is just the index and that's fine. But occasionally, and not very often in a career, you come to a great structural break and a great structural change. And if you've lived through 40 years of disinflation and then you go into, let's say, even just 20 years of inflation, remember that the winners, the big cap stocks, will be those who are adapted to the old environment. This is kind of like an evolutionary thing. And uh, you get rewarded with a high valuation for being well adapted to that. And then we go into the new system. And it may not be that your earnings do particularly bad. I mean, they might do and they might not. But you don't get that valuation because you were so good at this. The classic example is the so-called moat that people have paid up for for years. And the moat has been the ability to put prices up in a period when prices aren't going up. And people say, this is a fantastic thing for a company to be able to do. And it is. But remember, the definition kind of inflation is that everybody gets to put their price up. So why pay a premium for a moat? So that would be the first example. Uh, in terms of technology, you know, technology uh, through the ages has been a very, very difficult place to pick winners. And we're just at one of those peaks now where people assume that anybody can pick a winner. And, uh, you know, there will be winners and there will be people who are smart enough to pick them. But most of us, particularly us greybeards, will not be able to pick them. Won't be able to pick these winners. So there are quite a lot of losers in there as well, as well as uh, some winners. So at a structural change, you need to have active management. And people will think I am now an apologist for active management. Uh, but, you know, this is the time. This is the time when you're going to need it. You're going to really need it. And this is definitely not a time to be following an index. And that's because it's at a structural break, a structural shift. And everything that's worked for the last 30 or 40 years may not work anymore. But the index is composed of everything that's worked for the last 30 or 40 years. So it's going to be a dangerous place to be investing. And just one final point on that, Jack. If I'm right that the, the future is forcing savings institutions to buy bonds and sell equities, they can only sell what they own. And that's everything in the index. So you might want to be looking for some stuff that isn't in the index uh, as, a, as some sort of protection against that forced liquidation. Mm -hmm. Well, it's fascinating. Russell, it's been tremendous uh, hearing your insights. I so enjoy it. Hope you can come on again. Uh, Russell, I just want to say again, the, the book, which I uh, very much recommend reading, is The Asian Financial Crisis, Birth of the Age of Debt. Uh, I read it, learned so much, and I also feel like if I read it a second time, I'll probably learn even more than on my first time. So the book, uh, it is on Amazon, I believe. And then you also uh, recently launched a course, right? Yeah, so the course, it's a, it's a great course. So I've been running this course for 16 years in person, and I've educated over 1,500 mainly professional fund managers, but actually we've had a lot of, uh, I don't want to call it amateurs. I mean, in, in many ways, some of the people I meet who manage their own money know, know as much or more than the, than the so-called professionals, but mainly professional fund managers, but we've got, actually got a lot of people, other people who take it. Anyway, for the very first time, I put it online, and we got over 18 and a half hours of lectures there, and... Uh, you know, self-test questions and, uh, you know, looks at it's using financial history to try and understand the mechanism. And we think it helps you ask the right questions. And that's the crucial thing. And maybe it helps you get some of the right answers. So anyway, you can find out more about that. If you just put my name and course into the Internet, it usually pops up into Google. But Didasco Education, D-I-D-A-S-K-O Education, uh, you can buy it online, take it anywhere in the world as of last November. So very excited about that. Interesting. 
Russell, uh, do you also have a, a podcast? I listened to a podcast. You interviewed a, some, a gentleman who was very involved in uh, the Iceland banking system during the 2008 great financial crisis. Uh, do, is, that, is that a regular thing or is that a one-time thing? No, that, that's going to become regular. That was the first one. So I also run a thing called the Library of Mistakes, which is a business financial history library. But libraryofmistakes.com is our website, and you will be able to link into a series of podcasts that I'll now be putting out through the uh, through the Library of Mistakes. And then you can help us with our charitable goal. Our charitable goal is unique. We're the only people in the world who've got a charitable goal of changing the world one mistake at a time. I like that. Well, Russell, thank you so much again for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Jen. 